Brown residence, butler speaking. <laughs> I'm all right, how are you, Alex? I'm not bad for a boy. I have been working very hard. I'm as worn out as the zip on Robbie Williams' trousers. <laughs> Open down the country. How's it going? Because I've known you for so long, it feels like we're best mates, because I buy these DVDs every year, and I've got to be honest, if you're expecting me to slag you off, I'm probably going to disappoint the audience, because I've been to see you about ten times up and down the country, as you say, you do everywhere, and you pack these theatres out, but you never do interviews. Why wouldn't you talk to me before? Have I offended you? I think it was the old management team that were trying to protect us, and they didn't want me to go on live radio or TV and start effing and blinding, you know, as if, like, not giving me credit for what it's worth. I mean, I have comedian friends who they talk about me all the time. And one comedian friend said, oh, Chubby Brown, oh, yes. He's been around since Captain Cook was a sea cadet. He, I can tell you, I mean, <laughs> Chubby, when he started, head lice were pets. So <laughs> that's how long we've, we've been together. And I, I know everybody. and I, I talk to everybody on the phone. So why I've never been on to you, I do not know. I apologise for that. Well, I've put loads of requests in, and I don't blame you in a way, because I've got to set my stall out, which is that I like people like Jim Davidson, Bernard Manning, I know really well. I like him. I like Mike Reed. I like the people that are funny, and they're not wrapped up in this political correctness. And I've got to be honest with you, we've had a few complaints about this show recently, because I talk about a lot of stuff and get a lot of complaints. But it must seem to you now that, really, you can't say anything without upsetting people. Well, I do, I obviously. I mean, I've got a comedy mind, and you know what a comedy mind is like. Somebody says something, and you come back with an answer. And I have got into trouble before. I used to say, let's all tell jokes. All of us will all tell jokes about dogs, because dogs can't answer back. <laughs> they just look at you, wag the tail, when you <laughs> give them a biscuit, they can't answer back. Anybody can answer back. I mean, how many times do you think I've been called? What happened yesterday? I'm in Woolworths yesterday, and I'm in the queue, and a woman said, uh, King Kong. And the girl behind the counter said, do you want King Kong or King Thong? She said, it doesn't matter, they're both big, ugly b <laughs> <laughs> If you took offence at everybody, you'd, you, you know, you, you wouldn't have a life, would you? Well, and the heckle seems to be very much part of your show. If you didn't get a good heckle, I think you'd be slightly disappointed, wouldn't you? Well, that's it, isn't it? That, that's it. I mean, for years. I mean, don't do we, let me go back now, twenty-five years. I went on at twelve o'clock at night in the, on the South Pier at Blackpool, and it was full of drunk <laughs> and strippers. And you would go on there, and they would run down and burn the strippers' uh, asses with a with a fag end, and they'd start shouting abuse at me, and they'd throw pints at you, and I had to put up with all that. But after 37 years, you know, Alex, I think I've, I've deserved now a little bit of street cred now. I think I deserve to be listened to. I've, had, I've saved me time. Mm. I think, you know, and that's all I ask my audiences now is just have a listen to what I have to say. Don't get silly. Yeah, I saw you in Nottingham about three years ago, and there was a guy who was just so drunk, and it, it can add to your act when they start chirping in, but it can also destroy the act, because if it, if it gets in the middle of a good gag, you're screwed, aren't you? There's a big difference between a heckler and a... Well, a heck of a little weird till the end of the joke and shout, and you give him a clever answer. I don't want to fuck with that fuck lady alone, Jimmy Gale, come to fuck the idea, yeah. How can you answer that back? Do you still enjoy it? Because, I mean, you've, you've been doing it for so long. And, and what also amazes me about your DVDs, they are different every year, and there are some comedians that bring them out every year, and they don't actually do anything new on it. I mean, how difficult is it for you, A, now to think of new jokes, and B, do you still enjoy it? I always tell people that you can only form an idea from an idea. I watch, I listen. I'm observant. I read. I uh, I do uh, during the day. I'm, I don't think. I think I'm a 24-hour comic because I don't think I ever really come off stage. I don't mean I'm not trying to sit at the bar telling jokes all the time. I'm watching people, and if anybody tells me anything that's quite humorous, I'll write it down and then I'll think. Well, I won't I'll particularly take the line, but I'll have a go at, at uh, of uh, having a, having a go. At, try and make something of it, and try and make a punchline out of it, or try and make it funnier than it is even though it is already funny uh, somebody was asking me oh, oh was it not long ago I was being interviewed for a magazine uh, a woman's magazine and this lady was all she was talking about was racialism sexism and feminism and all this that and the other and she was really getting on my tits and uh, she went on and on and on about the rights and wrongs I said if I wanted to put the world's rights and wrongs I would have become a politician but I left school with with uh, with no all levels or anything like that. When I left school, I was as thick as two short planks. And I don't I mind admitting it. I've had a topsy-turvy life, and I've made some. It's more remarkable now that I've made a little bit of something of myself. And then she said, "Oh, I, su 
I suppose you're going to tell me you like Bernard Manning. I said, does Bill Clinton... <laughs> and that stopped that interview. <laughs> <laughs> How many interviews have you actually had chopped halfway through and they've just given up? Well, quite a few, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the likes of yourself understand what I'm all about. So I talk to you and, and it's great. And some of them don't know what I'm all about. A lot of people, they come along, they're, they're not, they don't, what, what, what did he just said? They yeah. can't, you know. But then again, you know, it, it takes all sorts, doesn't it? Well, I said on the air there was a lady walking down the street and my producer shouted sexist. I said it was a black woman. He said racist. I said it was Nigel Kennedy's mother. He said violinist. I mean, you can't say anything, can you? <laughs> I've just written that down, by the way. <laughs> you can have that for free. Uh, you're still with us. I'm still with you, Alex. I'm still here. I mean, in more ways than one, because I was very concerned to read a couple of years ago that you had to cancel some shows because you'd got throat cancer. How are you now? Well, that was that was the shock of my life, see, because I had a few nodules on the back of my throat, and I went along to the medical centre thinking, oh, the nodules have come back. And I was due to go to Australia on tour, and um, it, it, they did a biopsy because I kept getting a sore throat. I have this bloody dry cough all the time. And uh, he said, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Vesey, you've, uh, you've got throat cancer. Well, it's like it's like being hit with a sledgehammer. I, 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 I just didn't know what... I, I thought I wasn't going to come out of that room. You know, I, th mm. I thought of my children, my wife, my family, and <coughs> I, was, I was just gobsmacked. I re I, the room started to go around, and I actually said to the doctor, could you hold me glasses? And he had all my glasses. The next minute... Mm, there was a nurse putting some cold ice on my chest and on my uh, on my forehead, you know, saying, are you all right, Roy, are you all right? I, I passed out. So that's how tough I am. It's, it's mm. frightening, you know. Has it changed you or has it changed your act? Uh, well, I, I'm, I've been fortunate, haven't I? I can still work. I mean, a lot of people... I go to that hospital, Alex, week in and week out, and I see people sat there, and I go back a few months later, and they say, oh, we lost so-and-so, and we lost Pauline, and we lost Jackie, and, you know, you, you, your heart bleeds for these people. I've been fortunate. I was supposed to go to Australia on tour when I was diagnosed first off. And the specialist, I mean, they don't pull any punches. He just said to me, if you'd gone to Australia on tour uh, and come back with this, we'd have been talking about a completely different operation. We wouldn't have had to just move one vocal cord. We'd have had to move your voice box. So there, there, if there's such a person as God, he's been good to me. Let's talk about your act a minute now and, and what you do, because if I don't broach this, I'm going to be criticised and people say I'm not doing my job properly. Are there any limits? Is there anything you won't talk about? Well, I, I like to think that what I talk about is um, uh, domestic humour. It's funny. I mean, there's things like... Uh, I, I don't talk about um, abusing children and things like that. I'll, it's on the subject by mentioning people that's in the news, like Gary Glitter and Michael Jackson. But personally, uh, it's not the kind of subject I talk about. I don't do very many religious gags because I don't know any funny ones. And I, I don't I don't bend my mind that way, you see. Mm. I bend my mind more to the the, the one-liners that uh, like saying things like uh, uh, let's, let's off the top of my head now. I love getting old because you can pick the colour of your teeth. And uh, when I was little, I didn't want to be a fireman. I just liked breaking windows with an axe and I like little sarcastic one-liners like that because yeah. you see Ken Dodd was my hero he was my inspiration and I used to think years and years ago if you had Ken Dodd's timing Bob Monkhouse's material Tommy Cooper's face and uh, Bernard Manor's honesty you'd be the world's greatest comic mm. I know it doesn't work like that but so these things that um, it's, it's, it's having a conscience isn't it why did you decide, though, not to be a Ken Dodd? Because I write jokes for Ken Dodd, and, I mean, he won't even put anything in that's remotely boo to mother. I mean, he won't go anywhere near anything. Why did you decide to go the other way, then? Because it, when I started in 1970 and 71, there was around about 9,000 comedians in Britain trying to make a living doing things, for, you know. And I started doing these gentlemen's evenings, these smokers, these stag nights. And one day I was sat, and my manager said, you know, you're going to have a choice to make it, yeah? You can rather be another clean comic, because I was at the time. And he said, uh, and I'll get you work, obviously, and you'll earn money, but, uh, you know, or you could, he said, you've got something that a lot of people don't have. You have the gift of getting away with bad language and mucky jokes. And a lot of, not a lot of comics can do that. So, I mean, at the, that particular time, I was in it for the money. I mean, nobody mm. ever thinks you're going to make anything of your life. 
you know, I, I, I've, I've been in bands, I've been in trios and duos, then suddenly there I am stood on stage with a microphone in my hand and I'm thinking, hang on, this is better than climbing a ladder and carrying bricks. Mm. This is better than carrying a, a welder's torch. This is better than digging holes and scrubbing the streets. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, it was only 15 quid, £20 a night, but it was great. Yeah. And what you'd always dreamed of doing. Uh, yeah, and you know, it's like, it's a drug. You stood on that stage, it's an absolute drug. Let me ask you about the language as well, because I have to say, it doesn't particularly make me laugh, but I watch your audience roaring when you say the F word. It adds something to your act. Do you need it, though? Because I think you're clever enough and just as funny without it, or am I being naive? Well, I've, I've made a, a rod for my own back, haven't I? I've, you know, I've made me better have to lie on it. Well, I've started this thing, and it's been going for over 30 years. I couldn't very well change now. People wouldn't accept it. The majority of my audience, uh, I, I've took building site humour and put it on the stage. That's what I've been told by other people. You know, you, you don't know, you never analyse yourself, do you? No. Other people say this is what he's done. Uh, I've got away with it for thirty years, and uh, I mean, don't, we don't walk around the house effing and blinding all day. When the children are here, nobody swears. Well, I have to admit, I saw you in an Indian restaurant one night after a show. Um, I didn't introduce myself; just left you to get on with it. And you would never have guessed you were Roy Chubby Brown, the act, opposed to Roy Stambazy, because you were just the sweetest, nicest man. You were generous to everyone. And I kind of thought to myself, as I said to Bernard when I interviewed him, does it not bother you that people think you're just some thick thug that goes around doing the most outrageous humour and offending people? Because you're not like that. It, uh, what offends me, really, is when you're in the shop on the morning and you're buying a loaf of bread and somebody shouts across the shop, now then, she'll be a big fat. Go in there. People in that shop, you've got grandmothers in that shop, yeah. you've got wives and girlfriends and they don't have to put up with it but they look at you as if it's your fault a lot mm. of people can't, you know, they just can't see the man and then see the act it's two different people you yeah. call me schizophrenic if you want I'm are you embarrassed by the act or do you, do you just love no, it now no, no not after all this time I mean there was a, there was a time there was a time when uh, if a, anybody came to me after the act and said you said this and you said that and that and you, you're disgusting and you're despicable and you're obnoxious and you have to take it, you know, I mean, that's it. And you know when you're in this business, you can't raise your hand to anybody because you'll end up in court. Mm. And th 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 that's what happens. And in the media but, court as well, in all the papers. Oh, exactly. And I mean, I've, had, uh, I've been insulted, I've had my face spit in, you know. I mean, what I actually pulled a bloke off me, he jumped on me and I pulled him off, tore his T-shirt, and when I went to court, he had me for common assault, which is the, the least charge you can go for, and it cost me £250 for a... A T-shirt, he probably got off the market for five quid. Do you fear for your safety? Uh, well, I do have security. I've had to have security uh, over the years because um, you never know. You never know. Well, you don't know who's listening. You don't know you're entertaining, do you? No. And you don't know who's got an agenda. This new DVD, I think, is really funny, and, and all your DVDs make me laugh. One question, I know we've got to go shortly, but one question that makes me wonder about myself is, am I a racist laughing at a black joke? Or there's a joke, for example, in this new DVD about autism, and you, you wrote a song about it, and I laughed out loud, and afterwards, I felt like I'd kind of done something wrong because I thought, I'm the broadcaster, I'm meant to be higher than all this, but actually I laugh, so what does that make me? Well, you, only you can decide that. I mean, I got to the stage door one night and there was a woman there and she said, I loved your act, Chubby, but I didn't like what you did on the piano, which is what you were talking about. And she said, if you were involved, I said, hang on, before you say another word, I am involved. Right, first of all, my wife's brother is Down syndrome and I also have an autistic cousin. I said, and I do what I can. I raise money for charity and it's, it's the old rules again, isn't it? If you're going to pinpoint what you can say and what you can't say, you're going to get into trouble for that. But you're like Bernard, you see. You do all this charity work, but nobody knows about it. They just think you're the obnoxious, chubby brown that goes on offending everyone. Do you not understand what I mean? Because there's no positive uh, well, PR for you, your, your critics will always attack you for that, won't they? Well, the, the, it's the media, again. It's what, it's what they make you, isn't it? You know, um, it's, um, every time I read about myself, it starts off, the first line is always this foul mouth comic. Can't they think of something else? Is it always going to be this foul mouth comic? You know, can't they say something? There must be other words to use. And make me sound like an arsehole every time. Well, I, I mean, genuinely think that you're... It's hard work, Alex. You know that. It's hard work. You can't stand on stage for two hours and, and, and just think it comes to you. You've got to work at it. Because when we start off, none of us are funny, you know. We all think we're funny when we start off, but none of us are, really. It take, it's, a, it's a craft. 
it, it takes years and years to perfect. It's like, uh, how can I put it? It's like when the Spice Girls wrote their autobiography and they were only 20, 22 and 23. You know, auto, what have they done at 22 and 23? I'm just starting my biography now and I'm 61. <laughs> yes. You know, and, and I'm thinking about telling people what I've done and what I haven't done. And you're just starting. Yeah. It is interesting to me that every Christmas, me and the mates down the pub, we always race to get your DVD because we want to be the first one to tell your dirtiest or funniest gag. And the whole nation seems to do that. It's very underground, isn't it? The the pink liberals in London, the Guardian reading, champagne sipping, quiche eating journalists in London who don't watch your DVDs will say, oh, that's disgusting. But actually the reality is, in most households, most dads have seen, if not have a chubby brown DVD and love the gags in it. I mean, what kind of a thrill is that for you, knowing that you have penetrated society to the point where, without any publicity, you sell thousands of DVDs and you fill, fill theatres? Let me tell you something, Alex, you know, I've never, and I, I, I get shocked sometimes. I mean, I always thought London, you know, uh, they booked me at the Dominion Theatre in Tottenham Court Road, 1991, 1992, and we did three nights and it was sold out. And we had people there from the equivalent of Wall Street. We had all the bankers down there and we had all the solicitors and all that. And I absolutely tore them apart with just everyday humour. And it, 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 and that's why I remember coming back in the car thinking at that particular time, my my humour would never go in London, but it did. It, it went a bomb, you know. And that was like they, they were just, that's just one of several shocks I've had over the years. Mm. Like the first time I did, there were all women. There was a thousand women in this room, and I thought, well, you know, they're not gonna they're not gonna laugh at the men's jokes, are they? But they'll kill themselves. <laughs> they absolutely kill. Them. You have a way with words, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Listen, congratulations on this new DVD. It's called King Thong, and it's very funny. They're all funny. I mean, I, I love to collect them. Um, and, and one day when you're down in London, or, or I'll come and see you at one of the theatres, and we'll do a piece, a, a full hour, and we'll uh, get you to sign all my DVDs, because it's a real pleasure. As I say, I think you're much maligned. I can understand why some people find certain bits of your act offensive, but to be able to do what you do for so long and fill theatres pack them out, 3,000, 4,000 seater venues with no publicity, I think is remarkable. And there's only about you, there's Doddy, Jethro can do it, maybe Jim Davis and, and Lee Evans. That's about it, isn't it? That's, I think that's it, yeah, in a nutshell. When you think how many people live in this country and how many are actually doing our job. I, I feel sorry for the young comics coming through now, you know, Alex. They've got nowhere to go, have they? You know, the, the mm. club land's finished. Restaurants are not paying any money. Um, you know, it's, they've just got nowhere to go. The comedy clubs, the pain peanuts for them and the the work in the balls off these lads and they're just not getting anywhere it's there's, there's not you know, there just isn't anywhere for them to 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 uh to, to show their craft at all, is there? It seems to me, if you want to do it now, you go to Spain and you put Chubby's outfit on and nick all your gags. Well, I, when I go to Benidorm, I pass myself five times a day. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? There's a Chubby Brown in Tenerife, one in Gran Canary, Lanzarote, Cyprus, Malta. They're all over the place. <laughs> is that a compliment? Well, I just wish I'd pay my maintenance. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Roy Chubby Brown, Royston Vasey, thank you so much for coming on the Late Night Revolution here at Capital Gold, and uh, good luck with the new DVD, King Thong. I know it's going to be enormous, and you're doing th Frank Skinner this week. Do you think I he's going to leg... Yeah, Thursday, yeah. Do you think he's going to leg you over, or do you think he'll be nice to you? I don't know yet. I don't even know what he's going to ask me. Mm. Does that I, worry you? No, no, it doesn't. No, I've been in the business too long to get worried about that. All right. Thanks for coming on the show today. Royston Vasey, thank right. you. Bye-bye, Alex. The Alex Belfield In Conversation podcast with daisymedia.co.uk.